grace. Bless my boyfriend's hands and face. Bless his head full of curls and keep him safe from other girls. Bless his arms so big and strong and keep his hands where they belong. Amen. <laughs> Hail, Hail Mary, Mary, full, full of, of grace, grace I'm itching in my naughty place. It started when the priest came round. He made me kneel and kiss the ground. He made me pray, he made me sigh, and then he taught me how to lie. Amen. Hail Mary, full, full of, of grace, the Lord I bet your underwear's of lace. I bet you swear and piss a lot, and then you piss into a pot. I bet you never said your prayers or thank God for your curly hairs. Amen. What is this fury, this temper, this fever, this frenzy, this badgering, this anxiety, this tantrum of all's all about, you little nuisance? I'm cross because you won't let me be a courtesan as my godmother Lady Antonia advised you. Well, you can't have lunch at nine o'clock, you know. What are you now, a wicked stepmother? Whimper away, my little one, whimper away. I certainly will. You'd better forget your pride, Pippa. Forget it, I say. Because if you don't mend your ways, if you don't mend them, then people have nothing to cover your arse. Because there are so many whores out there nowadays that those who don't work miracles for a living won't be able to make ends meet. And it's not enough to have pretty eyes and silken braids. Only luck or skill will give you the edge, and the rest is a waste of time. If you say so. That is the way it is. But. If you listen to my advice and open your ears to what my experience can teach you, then, lucky, lucky you. Hurry up and make me a lady, then. I'm all ears. Why did you listen and stop fooling around with your head full of nonsense, as usual, while well, I tell you what's good for you? And then, I swear on these Hail Marys I mumble all day long, that within two weeks, at the most, you'll be on the market. God willing, Mother. You need to be willing, too. I am. Dear Mummy, precious Mummy. <laughs> well, if you are, then I am too. And my dear, I am certain you are going to be greater than any Pope's favourite. I see you ascending straight to heaven. So mind what I say. I'm listening. Pippa. Though I make people believe that you're 16, you're 20. Clear and plain. You were born just at the end of Leo's conclave, when the whole of Rome was shouting, Medici! Medici! I was screaming, Oh God! Oh God! Oh! Oh! Oh God! on the doors of St. Peter's that I had you. Then don't keep me here cooling my heels. My cousin Sandro says they use 11 and 12 year olds all over the world and that anything else is pretty worthless. Well, you know, I can't deny it. But then you don't even look 14. <laughs> but you're going to have to listen. Let's get back to the point. Pippa, men who squander money, their reputation, in fact, their very lives running after whores, are always complaining about the stupidity of one of them, as if the whore's stupidity was the thing that's ruining them, and they threaten and despise them, little realising that the fluff that's in the whore's head is the punter's good fortune. So I've decided that you are going to be wiser, and you are going to make them feel first-hand that they'd have been in real trouble if the whores they'd come across hadn't been mere thieves, traitors, rogues, fools. put up with it for six, seven or ten years, they eventually wise up because of all the treacheries and betrayals that they've been subjected to and they send the whores off to the pillory. And if some whores are starving and suffering from cancer, leprosy and the French disease at their own expense, it's because they've never spent a single sensible hour. I think I'm beginning to understand. Yeah, well fix my sermons and my gospels in your head. They will make everything plain to you in a few, a few words. If a, a doctor, a philosopher, a merchant, a soldier, 
A monk? A priest? A priest? A priest? A hermit? A gentleman? A monsignor? And King Solomon himself is made to look a fool by the most hairbrained of fools. Just think how a courtesan with an ounce of common sense would deal with those fellows. She'd get the better of them. So you see, my dear, becoming a whore is no career for a fool. As well I know it. It takes more for more than just lifting your skirts and going, oh, come! I'm coming. <laughs> shut up shop the day it opens. But my dear, you know, when word gets around that you're on the market, I'm sure that many will want to be first served. And I'll be like a confessor, reconciling a rabble with a psh, 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 from one man's servant or another, and you'll always be booked by at least a dozen. We need them to be more days of week than there are in a month. <laughs> and that I'll be careful. And I'll say to such and such a man's servant, yes, it's true that my pippa let herself get caught once. God knows how. But my little daughter is purer than a dove and she is not to blame. And upon my word, it was only once. And I won't give her over to any commoner. But your lordship has charmed me so much that I simply can't say no. So she'll be over straight after the Hail Marys. <laughs> when you get there, he'll come to meet you. Either at the top of the stairs, or maybe even as far as the entrance. Compose yourself, as you may have got a bit ruffled on the way over. Tidy yourself up a bit, all the while sneaking a little glimpse at his companions who will quite naturally be keeping fairly close. Then stare humbly into his eyes and giving him a scented curtsy, unfurl a greeting the way that brides and women in childbed do when their husbands, friends and relatives come to visit. It might make me blush, which would make me very happy, because the rouge that modesty puts on a young girl's cheek would sat satisfy any son. All right. And then, once the formalities are over, the man that you are going to be sleeping with will make you sit beside him. And as he takes your hand, he'll flatter me. I will be keeping my eyes firmly fixed on your face, as though amazed by your beauty, and serves to direct the gaze of the other guests onto your face, so that he will have to say, Med, your mother has good reason to adore you, since others produce females, and she, angels, and if while saying something like this, he should happen to bend down and drop a kiss on your eye or forehead, turn to him sleepy and let out a little sigh. Ah! 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 That he can barely hear. And if you can, make your cheeks go pink the way I told you, and he will fall for you at once. Certainly. Why? Because the rouge that modesty puts on a young girl's face would satisfy any soul, and because blushing and sighing together are a sign of love. They betray the first stirrings of passion. Then, as he's talking to you, he'll draw you gradually into a corner. And then, with the most subtle and sweetest words that he can manage, he'll start to chat you on. Here, you must answer on cue. Try not to say anything that smacks of the brothel. Don't swear by God or the saints. And when you're called for dinner, though you should always be the first to wash your hands and make your way to the table, let them call you more than once, for one is exalted for one's humility. I'll do that. And when the salad arrives, don't rush at it like a cow at hay. But take teeny weeny mouthfuls, bring them through your lips without greasing so much as a finger. And don't lower your head, gobbling up off the plate as I've seen some of us do, but keep majestically erect, extending a hand graciously. And if you ask for a drink, do it with a nod of your head. If the decanters are on the table, serve yourself. But 
only fill the glass halfway. Then bring it slowly to your lips, but never drink at all. But what if I'm very thirsty? Still, only drink a very little bit, so you don't get a bit of reputation for a drunkard and a glutton. And while you're having dinner, talk as little as possible. If nobody questions you, make sure the conversation doesn't come from you. If someone offers you the leg or wing of a cake or partridge, no, accept it graciously, all the while glancing at your lover with a gesture that begs his permission without asking for it. And when you've finished eating, don't belch for the love of God. What if I want to escape me? My God, you'd be finished. You'd fall straight into the gutter. And if I do exactly what you say, and more, what happens then? Then you will be renowned as the most talented and gracious courtesan alive. And when people talk about the other girls, they'll say, Shut up! Very <laughs> shadow of Lady Dippers. I'll choose this wolf birth more than such and such a girl will end up. And those who love you will be your slaves, and you'll be more sought after than those who behave like rascals and rogues are shunned. And just think how delighted I'll be. What should I do once you finish eating? Amuse yourself for a while with the man sitting next to you, but never leave your lover's side. And when bedtime has comes around, let me go back home. Then, having reverently said, Good night, your lordships. Take more care than with fire not to be seen or heard peeing or easing your bowels. Or even carrying a handkerchief to wipe yourself with, because things like that are enough to make a chicken wrench and they pick up all sorts of things. Having secured yourself in the bedroom, take a look around to see if there's a piece of linen or a cap that you like. And without asking, start praising the linen or the caps. What for? So that the dog, sent in the bitch, offers you either one or the other. And if he offers me them? Slip him a kiss with the tip of your tongue and accept. Then, as he gets straight into bed, you begin undressing very slowly, murmuring a few words to yourself and letting out a few little sighs, so that when you sleep in beside him, he has to say, My love, why are you sighing? Then, let out another heartfelt sigh. Oh. Your lordship has charmed me. <laughs> Squeezing him tightly as you say it, then kiss him again and again, and make the sign of the cross, pretending you forgot to do it before you got in. And if you don't want to say your prayers or anything, murmur a few words under your breath so that you appear well-mannered in everything you do. Meanwhile, the scoundrel, who's been waiting for you in bed the way that a man sits at table before the bread and the wine have even come out, will start fondling your tits, shoving his entire face in as if to drink from them. Then, He'll slide his hands down your body until he reaches your little cunt. After a few pats, he'll start fondling your thighs. And then because your buttocks draw his hand, they'll soon attract him, I can tell you. <laughs> then, after playing with them for a bit, he'll wedge his knee between your thighs and try to turn you over. But you go rigid. <laughs> don't turn over. Even if he starts whining like a spoiled child, don't turn over. What if he forces me? No one gets forced, silly girl. And why should I make him do it in front rather than behind? Simpleton, you talk just like the fool you are. What is worth more, a Julio or a Duffet? I get it. Silver is worth less than gold. That's it. Now I'm thinking of a trick. Oh, teach it to me. It's a good one. Oh, please, mummy. A very good one. Please. Well, if he keeps wedging his knee between your thighs trying to have you his way, look around and feel around to see if he's got any bracelets on his wrists or rings on his fingers. And if he does, while the blowfire is flitting around, tempted by the smell of the roast, see if he'll let you take them off. And if he does, well, let him do it his way. Once you've taken all his jewels, you'll swing them all right. And if he doesn't, Turn to him and say, so your lordship goes in for that nasty stuff. And then he'll take you the right way. And when he climbs on top of you, Pippa, get down to it. Do it. 
because the caresses that make these jousters come quickly are their downfall. A whore who can do it well is best compared to a merchant who can sell his wares at a high price. The games, the flattery and the titillations of a cunning whore are best compared to a haberdashery shop. What a comparison! <laughs> Imagine a shopkeeper who in his shop has laces, looking glasses, gloves, diadems, ribbons, thimbles, pins, needles, bonnets, trimmings, soap, scented oil, cypress powder, wigs, and a hundred thousand other things. So, in her shop, a whore has smiles, sweet talk, kisses, glances, but this is nothing, in her hands and in her pussy. She has emeralds, diamonds, rubies, pearls, and the very melody of the world. How's that? How? There is not a single man who doesn't touch heaven when the woman that he's making love to, while slipping in a tongue kiss, grabs his thingy, squeezing it two or three times so that it stands erect. Then, stiff as it is, she gives it a little shake, making his mouth water. A few moments later, she takes his little jingly bobs in the palm of her hand, <laughs> jiggles them a little, then she slaps his ass, scratches around in the hair, grabs his thing again, until the cucumber, fully ripe, looks like someone trying to retch it, can't quite manage it. <laughs> the poor lovesick boy is beside himself with all these caresses, and he wouldn't exchange his pleasure for that of a piglet being scratched. What am I hearing? Listen, and learn how to sell your merchandise. I believe you. Take it as read. You want me to be decent, then teach me shameless and decency. Well, I am not being inconsistent. I want you to be as much of a whore in bed as you are a lady elsewhere, so that there isn't a caress that the men you sleep with can't imagine you would give them, and always be on the lookout to scratch them where it itches. <laughs> Sleeping with them. <laughs> I can't help laughing 
because they're going to have to stay away from the toilet the way I said you should. Oh God, what farts, what stenches they let loose. The bellows of the blacksmith can't blow that hard. And while they're contorting their snouts, forcing themselves to shit out twice, they've got a bag of licorice in their hand to suit the cough that tortures them. When they take off their doublets, they're really a sight to look at, I can tell you. They put the sparrow up in your hand, get a straddle, suck on your tits, twist you and turn you this way and that. You keep moving around, ticking in their sides and armpits, and when you feel their thingy coming to itself, grab it and shake it so artfully that it raises its head bit by bit. <laughs> so, even these old codgers ones rise up proudly. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but they fall down again just as quickly. If you'd seen your father, God bless him, in his final illness trying to sit up in bed, falling back again, you could imagine one of these old pricks. They're like earthworms, folding into themselves and pushing out again as they're falling <laughs> one of those academics to attack you in writing and have the gossip spread everywhere with those scandalous things they're so good at saying about women. You'd be in a nice fix if someone put your life in writing the way some good-for-nothing did mine and how they barked on my account. All those who reproach me for what I said about nuns, saying she lies about everything, don't know that I only told Antonia to make her laugh and not to cause a scandal, as I easily might have done. But the world isn't what it used to be. An inexperienced person can't live in it anymore. Don't get worked up. Pippa, I was a nun. And I left because I left. And if I had wanted to tell Antonia how they get married and how the nun calls a monk, my little friend, and how the monk calls a nun, my little friend, well, I easily could have done. And all the things that those gut buckets say to their little friends when they come back from preaching in some place is enough to stupefy the stigmata. Are there really so many stories? Oh, there are even more that I can't remember. You toffee noses and ignoramuses, what would they have said if I had told Antonia how the mistress of the novices knows exactly whenever, oh, Sister Crucianza or, oh, Sister Gaudencia is on heat. You gossips, scum of the earth. May you all be flogged for carping at the, the speech of someone who could be your teacher. Why, aren't, aren't people allowed to speak as they wish? Oh, let the fools ramble away. All they do is scoff at those who speak in their native dialect. Well, they mince their expressions as well mince this chicory. I beg you, my dear, not to give up the speech that your mother taught you, leaving the echoes and alarms to the, la the ladies, and la let them have their way when using some new and refined term, they say, oh, go, but the heavens may be precious and oh, the hours be pinkness, and scoff at those who say, oi, oity toity, argy bargy, willy nilly, dilly dally, 
Love it, darling. Thank you, thank you. Grumpy, pumpy. Dingle, dangle. And a hundred other words without frills. The crows! Well said. But I live a simple life, and I don't care if zilch is commoner than naught. And I speak as I, I wish, not with my cheeks puffed out, spitting out such solemn names. And when I walk, I walk with my own feet, not a crane's. And I don't fork the words out of my mouth. I speak them plainly. They're just words, not confectionaries. And when I speak, I look like a woman, not a magpie. So Nana is Nana. And all those who carp about everything without ever stirring their asses will never get their names out of the taverns. While mine has been trotted all the way to Constantinople. Those washed up wretches are playing with fire. They're asking to get the finger from us one of these days as they keep muttering about our way of talking. It's too right, but I don't care if zilch is common in the north, because I live a simple life. Don't dwell on those hotspots any longer. My brain is getting muddled, and I might forget the things that really matter. Well, you know, you are right. My anger at those purebreds who rack their brains to make salads and spices sauces out of underfed words has caused me to lose my way, and then, with their with the obstinacy of crabs and tick lice, want to try it for all costs. But I remember I was talking about the academics, who more often than not, you will find at noble those tables. God help me with those lords. But I want to teach you a little trick so that even the villains drop dead when it costs them. While his lordship is getting undressed, take his cap and put it on your head. Then, put on his gown and take a few little turns around the room. When His Highness sees you transfer from a woman to a man, he'll jump on you like a hung on hot bread and unable to wait for you to get to bed. He'll want you with your head against a wall or a linen chest. I get the picture. But most of all, practice deceit and flattery the way I told you, because these are the frills that help you earn a living. Men want to be duped, so I never give short measure of smiles, kisses, glances. Always hold their hand, and every now and then, nip at their teeth, so that they give that, oh, oh! that men let out when they feel a pang of bliss. The cornerstone of a whore's art is knowing how to be gallant to the gullible. I get it loud and clear. I'm thinking, what? That while I'm teaching you, I'm also guiding all those who have dealings with you because you can be sure they'll know when you're using your words. So my teaching is like one of those paintings that looks down from all angles at whoever's looking at it. Who do you think would tell on me? This room, those lights, these statues, the piano, this fly wants to nibble at my nose. Flies are persistent, but men who are jealous are even more annoying. They become a nuisance even to themselves with all their candlelight scheming, trying to keep an eye on women who can't be kept in check when she decides to cheat on them. You'll also come across men who can be in love without being jealous. For a man cut from this timber, there is a tincture that can just one Two drops could rouse an entire whorehouse to bits of jealousy. What tincture is that? Get someone that you trust to write you a little letter. beginning of this letter because there is no health in me. I can recover it only if your pity would allow me to tell you in that place that it is most convenient for you what I dare not confide in writing or by messenger. And so I implore by your divine beauty that nature with God's consent has borrowed from the angels to bestow on you to be allowed to speak. 
for I have things to say that shall make you happy. And the more so, the sooner I obtain the audience I beg for on bended knee. And so, I await a reply that savors of the grace that radiates from your lovely countenance. And should you refuse to grant it to me as you refuse the pearls I sent you, not as a gift, but as a sign of goodwill, etc., etc., I will escape. I, I should escape from my woes by steel or rope or poison. I kiss your gracious ladyship's hand. <laughs> With the address and signature, which in a case like this, the person writing the letter will know how to do. What should I do once it's written? Fold it carefully, then slip it inside a glove, so that the, and then drop it carelessly somewhere, so that the jealousy, which before filled only his socks, rises until it fills his lungs. As soon as the wretch sees the glove, he'll pick it up, and as soon as he picks it up, he'll fill the letter, and as soon as he feels the letter, He'll steal it, withdrawing to a little corner to read it. As he reads, he'll begin to hiss like a viper. And when he gets to the bit about the rejected pearls, his courage will drop to his boots, the bile rising in his throat. I tell you, the devil gets into a man when he comes across a rival, and nothing can describe the fever that shakes a man who, thinking he's alone at supper, sees someone else sneak in who might steal the entire piece of meat. When he's finished reading the letter, he can put it back where he found it, that is, inside the glove. Tell me what this plot will achieve. But it'll mean that he has no peace of mind left. He'll think that every man he sees on your street is the one who wrote it, or his goon, and so as not to give you any reason to accept offers, he'll start being even more generous. Now, to the box. I've heard enough about potters. I need you to tell me how to put on and take off makeup. And I'd like to know if I should believe in witchcraft, charms, and other spells. My fresh and tasty advice is all the charm you need. And as for grooming yourself, I'll teach you how. But the monks are calling and urging me to tell you how it is that women smell a bit off to them these days. It's all down to the priests, the prelates, the primates, the curates, the ministers, and the rest of the rabble of reverends and right reverends. When they sleep with a woman, they've got about as much appetite as a man who's been gorging their guts. And even if you sing them that song that's meant for old men, Now, 
I'm sure you'll make your own way and do things differently to me. Choose your own style of annoyance. I mean... You've already taught me how I should go on with men. I need to know how much you'll hurt when they take my virginity. Not at all. Only me. Will it make me shriek like someone having a boil pit? Certainly not. Like cutting a finger? Less than that. Like a tooth being pulled? Less. Like cracking your head? Not even close. Um, like an ingrown toenail. Do you want me to really bring it home to you? Yes. Do you remember ever scratching an itch like Miles Scabies? I do. Well, the pain you feel, the burning sensation after scratching is just like the pain you feel when you're high in school. Then why are girls so frightened of losing their virginity? My cousin said some girls jump out of bed, some scream for help, and others bleed all over the chest, the room, and anything closest. That is just the fear of those who don't know what to expect. It was very common in the old days. A girl who has bravely had it in her will say, and I thought doing the deed was a big deal. I'm glad to hear it. The day before you come on the market, I will teach you how to fake your virginity as many times as you want to. <laughs> well, I, I may pretend like a virgin, but there will be no lot of those courtiers don't know anything about virgins or martyrs. All you need to do is pee on them a little bit and pretend the piss is blood. As long as they can put it in you, it's enough for them. It's a trick used in all the best brothels. Sounds good to me. Now, Pepper, here's something to pay attention to. There are some fools who plot themselves outstretched on the bed and they think they're doing brilliantly so long as they're considered the best and they can sell their flesh by the pound to the highest bidder. And it's just flesh, not goods sold at auction. Little do they know, the poor wretches, that they end up where they were destined from the start and all along, on bridges and in hospitals, where starving, Frenchified and shattered, they'll make anyone who can bear to look at them wretch with disgust. I'm telling you, not all the gold that those scrounging Spaniards found in the New World couldn't compensate those whores for how ugly and unlucky they'll end up. And as if to prove I'm speaking from the mouth of truth, think about a whore who's obligated to this or that pimp. She never gets an hour's rest, whether she stays in or goes out, in bed or at table. If she's sleeping, she can't sleep. In fact, she has to stay awake to caress some mangy mutt or some dumb breath punter or the brick shit house who trample all over her. If she goes out, the pimp's in a fury. And if she stays in and gets that funny feeling that sometimes makes you feel melancholy without really being melancholy, well, he's angry. There's nothing to be gained with pimps, I'm sure. Get rid of them straight away. Stay free. I will. And another thing. Don't follow the usual path of the common whore, whose idea of being loyal is never being loyal. Just die rather than jilt anybody. Now, Pippa, here's something to think about. If I, the most wicked and villainous whore in Rome, Italy, actually the world, <laughs> manage to get myself covered in gold rather than copper, while speaking evil, doing worse, and betraying friends, foes, and well-wishers without a second glance. Just think how much you can achieve if you follow my teaching. I'll be the queen of queens, not just the lady of ladies. So heed my advice. Stay free. I will. <laughs> Thank you.
Let me tell you how my mother and I settled in Rome. If memory serves me well, it was the eve of St. Peter's Day. God knows the delight that was mine, watching the Bengal lights and hearing the crackling of the fireworks above the Castle Sant'Angelo. Seeing the crowds on the bridge, in the streets, on the riverbank. We lived near Tardinon, in a room with many a book from the curtain. We'd been there only eight days when my mother spoke about me to one courtier. Overnight, we saw gentlemen walking by the inn, up and down the road like horses in training, talking about me, though I would not show an ounce of my body. I would watch them from behind a jealousy window, open it to show within an inch of my face, and then close it again quickly. And even though I was already beautiful, watch it getting, letting them catch a glimpse of my beauty made me even more beautiful to them. And so, more men wished to see me, and all of Rome would talk about this foreigner who had just arrived in town. And since new things are loved especially, men would rush to see me, queuing in line, and the lady innkeeper who had grown fond of me so full of grace, I seem to her, could not rest one minute, because people would endlessly knock at the door, and she'd even take a few coins to give me a message in which they begged me to let them in. And my wise mother, whose advice I take regarding all my actions, past, present, and future, wasn't having any of them. She'd say, do you think I'm that kind of a woman? I'm a lady. I've known how to protect us from any misfortune, and I pray to God it will stay that way. And with each of these words, my beauty kept growing. Have you ever seen a little bird at the window of a granary, peck a few grains and then fly away. It would come back with one more bird, then two, then four, then ten, then thirty, then the whole flock. Those were the lovers around our house wanting to slip their beaks into my granary. I could not tire of seeing those suitors and would spend hours admiring behind the shutters the refinement of their robes, the satin of their ribbons, the medals on their hats, their golden necklaces, their, their horses in their shiny attire. They're going around with their entourage in their carriages, holding a little volume of Petrarca in their hands. They would sing with all kinds of mannerisms. <laughs> After having had my face washed with a rather strong acrobiti of hers, she let me sit at the window where most of my courtiers would take their walk outside. When I appeared, I was like the start of the three wise men and everyone rejoiced. They let go of their horses' reins so they could see me, hiding their faces like thieves caught in broad daylight. Craning their heads, they looked like those birds from those faraway worlds that feed on pure air. Now I pretended to have honesty of a nun and looked as confident as a wolf. I would act like a whore. <laughs> Taken 
gnawed for delectation. With untold wealth, I've now come home to see my mother here in Rome. Keep her safely close to me, and I'll refrain, refrain from blasphemy. Oh, oh Ned! Oh, Ned! <laughs> Where have you been? I've travelled across Europe. As you know, after leaving the shores of the Tiber, I travelled to France. I used to love a Frenchman when I was young. Those Frenchmen. <laughs> now, there was this one Frenchman. With him, I learned that I had to open my door at once, open it up in a flash. While he cheerfully cuddled and French kissed me, I opened up the wine. With men of this nation, you can forget the usual attitude of whores who wouldn't give you a glass of water if they saw you dying. After a few sips, I started cozying up to him. Without too much preamble, I agreed to sleep with him, politely sending the others away. He filled my kitchen full of so much food, it, it looked like carnival time. But what else? He'd escaped my clutches with nothing but the shirt on his back, because those drunkards are better at spending their earning and better at forgetting than remembering any injury, so they don't give a hoot if you rob them or not. Honest Frenchman, God bless them all. Were there any uh, men from Lyon to, to meet you on the road? I covered them with caresses. Because men from Lyon, in Lyon, are like people with full bladders who don't dare piss out of respect for the place they're in. But once they're out of Lyon, they'd fill a lake with the urine that gushes from their pipes. It's the same thing with their money. Added to which they're clever, courteous, refined, witty and amusing and even if they fed you on nothing more than your ch their sharp, charming talk, you'd be quite content with you. Not me. It's just a figure of speech. Suffice it to say, they spend as much as they can, give banquets and feasts with a special flair that others don't have. And besides, everyone likes their language. And the French give you diamonds, while the Spaniards give you parts. Now, the Germans, I cut from a different cloth and it's worth having designs on them. Germans are to be stripped in secret. They will let themselves be stripped. Oh, by nature they're stern, bitter and beastly. But once they get something into their heads, God alone can drive it out, so I buttered them up with the sweetness of my agreement. Were there any Italians to meet you on the road? Venetian merchants, maybe? I'm not going to tell you. As if I said everything they deserved I've said about them, people would tell me, love has blinded you. But it has not blinded me at all because they are gods and masters of everything and the most beautiful youths, the most beautiful men and the most beautiful silver foxes in the world. And once you take all the others out of their pompous robes, they look like wax puppets in comparison. And even though the Venetians are proud, they're goodness personified. And even though they count their pennies, when it comes to us, they spend royally, and anyone who knows how to get on their good side will be content. Everything is a joke to them. Except for the crop of their brown full of ducats. So common in hell at high water. You know they won't just give you a pittance. God bless them. Bless them he did. The Venetians have their own peculiar tastes. They like soft. Fur masses, tits and flesh, between 15 or 16 and 20 years old, and no Petrarchan subtleties. And so, Mother, I put aside the quarters and manners you taught me and gave them what they wanted because I wanted them to throw shimmering gold at me and not misty words. And as for myself, if I were a man, I'd prefer to bed down with a woman who has a honey tongue and not a learned one. And I'd feel happier holding a beautiful woman in my arms than the works of Messer Dante himself. And it seems to me a different melody that's made by a daring hand, gently plucking at the bosom like a lute, settling just on a nipple, not too hard, nor too soft. And the sound made by a hand slapping the sanctum of the buttocks seems to me a different melody than the music made by the five players of the Castel Sant'Angelo when the Cardinals visit the Vatican. And I can just see the same hand leaving its strum and making its way down the bodice, which, as it breathes in and sighs out, rises and falls as a painting would if it were alive. Oh, you are such a painter with words. I felt like the hand you were describing 
hands touching my breast. I can't say it. I could see you were excited just by your face and changing completely. Then it went red as I made you see forgotten things. Now onwards to <laughs> Toulouse. I'd have to say those Barney men from Toulouse are the sweetest of men there. Though I've heard they got worse in recent years. Though of all the men I've had dealings with, I reckon they're the best. They have something Italian about them as far as their courtesy and virtues go, though they're not as shrewd nor as stingy. Anyone knows how them now to hoodwink them will be able to shear them down to the hide. They're actually just dupes with honourable and pleasant manners. And they must be just right for you. Of course they were. Now. Hmm? Oh. Marseille. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say another word, just thinking about them gives me heart failure. Eh, hey, bella, bella, so la vita Men from Marseille are there to keep you from dozing off. Or to give you a good feed once a month, maybe, when you're in the mood for it. Or you're on your own, or someone of no importance. They're bragging, which is sky level, I can tell you. Bring up the subject of horses. They have the best ones for spare. Clothes, they have two or three wardrobe fillers. We have piles of money and all the beauties of the realm are dying to be with them. And if you happen to drop your handkerchief or glove, they pick it up with the sweetest turn of affairs ever to be heard at the court of Avignon. Yes, indeed. Men from Marseille will never let you go short of the necessary. I gave those fellows their money's worth, measuring out my wares as they measured out theirs. And I learned not to be put off by their throaty, nasal, sobbing talk. Take it as it comes. Men from Lille are more attractive than their language, too. Some can be sweet and adorable. But then I came back to Rome. Oh, those, those Romans. Romans. <laughs> if you're happy living on bread and cheese, with a salad of stories about swords and pikes, seasoned with the feats their great grandfathers performed against the sheriffs, then by, by all means hang around with them. But when Rome was sacked, they shat themselves, pardon my French, which is why no club hasn't lived to them since. Have you forgot? Paris. <laughs> Never forget the men from Paris. Forget them? Why? What would Hall's rooms be like without the shadows of their long, overgrown shafts? Those jackasses and peacocks in Paris, I handled them like a good whore, wheedling out as much as I could, as quick as I could. I called them by the title of knight or count. Yes, sir, no, sir, is what they like best. And with these men, a little bit of swindling won't spoil the soup. And it's quite respectable to con them and then boast about it, because they cheat poor courtesans too, and then brag about it in all the taverns they visit. And now, so you'll understand that I've learned how to cheat without cheating, I want to tell you a couple of stories I haven't told anybody. In fact, I've been Keep in the wrong prison for a rainy day and, and for the comfort of your old age. Be in them. The first trick is the lowest of the low, the second the highest of the high. Let's start with a little one. I had a servant girl who died on me at 13. Round and plump, very pretty, clever, crafty, as naughty as they come, and God knows a real chatterbox. And such a little fox, such a double dealer as would, would make you run a mile. I taught her what she had to do to get, or rather steal, money for the housekeeper. And what did she do? She soon learned to win the good graces of whoever came to my house, local or foreigner, by babbling around with one man or another until no one's had anything better to do than flirt with her. 
I'd make her hold in her hand a bowl, a china bowl, broken into three pieces, and when a man would knock at the door, she'd pull out a cord, run to the head of the stairs, all dishevelled, crying, Oh, I'm a dead girl! Oh, I've had it! While she was pretending she wanted to run away, my other older maid would hold her firmly by the hem of her skirt, saying, Dawn, don't do it! The mistress isn't going to hurt you! The unthinking man, seeing her so upset, would grab her arm all agitated, saying, Why all the crying? Why all the wailing? I've broken this thing that's worth a ducking! Let go of me! She'll kill me if she catches me! And she delivered these lies with such deaf gesticulations, a few heartfelt sighs and simulated swooning. It would have, would have aroused compassion and jackal with a one-handed hangman, let alone my gentleman caller. <laughs> Meanwhile, I stood at a peephole in my room with my handkerchief stuffed in my mouth so he wouldn't hear me laugh while he tighter than a clenched fist slept his food into her hand and I thought I'd bask with my other older maid grabbed it from her and ran down the stairs to make him think she'd gone to buy another bowl. Poor oh, little crow. <laughs> At this point, I came into the room. He said, I have come to pay my respects to your ladyship, taking my hand and kissing it softly. After he'd stay chatting to me for around 20 minutes, the girl would come back in. I'll just put this back in your room. What's the matter? Why do you look so sullen? And I'd sick, and the little rascal would signal to him not to give the game away. You need more skills than a doctor to be a courtesan. And so adapting this ruse to every man who came to my house. Now holding a plate, now a glass, now a bowl. She'd swindle two, four, sometimes five juniors from this purse or that. And my housekeeping would pay for some nice little banquets. <laughs> now for the big one. And I will buy it even before you start. An officer. A man whose position assured of an income of around 2,000 ducats had fallen so madly in love with me. His suffering would have accounted uh, for all of his sins. This fellow spent money once in a blue moon. And you had to be an astrologer, I can tell you, if you wanted to get any out of him when he wasn't in the mood to give it to you. In fact, lunacy itself didn't exist until the day he was born. Now, every little words spoken out of turn, he'd fly into a rage. But I learned to be fearless and stayed the course with him. And even though he played his monkey tricks on me, I defended myself coming, always thinking how I could put one over on him to pay him back for the lot. What did you do? In the end, I thought so hard I found the answer. I opened up to a painter. I may as well tell you, it was my surrender there, granting him a few little <laughs> on the understanding he should do what I told him. So, hiding under my bed with his paint and his brushes, he'd paint a gash on my cheek when the, fake, when the time came. I also confided in Maestro Andrea, uh, Dr. Mercurio, of blessed memory. You must remember him. Oh, I knew him well. <laughs> I told him he had set for him one night and that he should come with some lint and some eggs. He didn't leave his house on the night of the stick. Now, Picture the scene. My son's there is under my bed. Dr. Mercurio is waiting at home, and I'm at the table with the officer. We had almost finished eating when I happened to mention one of His Excellency's chamberlains, who he hated hearing me talk about doing it on purpose just to tease him. Well, it doesn't take much of a spark to light dry straw. And as he was yelling, Slut, bitch, Jezebel, I tried to retort, and he struck me on the cheek with the flat of his dagger, and I felt it, I can tell you. Well, I had in my pocket some sort of oily varnish given to me by Matthew and Rihanna. I rubbed my hands and face in it, and letting out one of the most fearful shrieks ever to be heard, even from a woman in labour, made him believe he caught me with the blade. And he, as scared as if he'd murdered someone, took to his heels and fled to Cardinal Colonna's palace where he locked himself in one of his courtier's rooms and crying and mumbling, Oh God, I think I've lost people, oh man, my commission. Meanwhile, 
I shot myself in my bedroom with just my old maid, and most of Andrea having been flushed from his hiding place, painted such a gash over my right cheek with a single stroke that seeing myself in the mirror, I thought I'd faint from shock. At, at this point, Dr. Mercurio, summoned by the trickster who broke a bubble, came in. Don't worry, not half a dozen. Then, leaving the paint time to dry, he took the lint, steeped it in rosal and eggs, and, after bandaging the wound, moved into the living room where a large crowd had gathered. She won't have been. The news spread all over the room. Even the officer, now a murderer, heard echo of it wept like a smack child. The next morning, the doctor came and, holding a two penny candle to it, removed the dressing at which a great many people craning their rooms into the craning their heads into the room in which all the shutters had been left closed, started to cry, and someone or other fainted, too squeamish at the sight of such a terrible wound. And so it became public knowledge that if the worst came to the worst, my face was ruined to it forever. And the vim, sending me money, doctors and medicines, tried to take cover from the sheriff, not entirely reassured by Colonna's support. A week later, I gave word that I had survived. No scum. Which is a fate worse than death for a courtier. <laughs> Our friend, while soothing me with money, sparing no efforts, so managed to enlist so many of his friends and patrons that in the end, we came to an agreement. Although I never let him see me. In short, 500 bucks Ducats were dispersed for the damages and 50 more for doctors and medicines, and I forgave him. <laughs> that is to say, I agreed not to pursue charges against him with the governor, demanding just his assurance that I be left in peace. And, and that was the money I spent on the house, apart from the garden that I added later. You were valiant, Pippa, to perform a feat like that. I'm not at the Alleluia yet. If I told you all my stories, we'd be here until next year. Wasted my time, no, no mother, I haven't. And you know, I can see that straight away. <laughs> well, let's move on. It seemed to me that these 500 plus the 50 had just whetted my appetite. <laughs> so I thought of a whorish trick of the utmost whorishness. What did you do? I found a travelling man from Marseille, a rascal to end all rascals who had the reputation of holding the secret to removing all traces left on one's face from the skull. He came to see me, saying, I'm permanent to the deposit of a hundred scud I will make sure there is no more trace of the skull than there is here. Go tell that miracle to the man who is to blame for my no longer being. And I turned away and started sobbing. The rogue, in his very respectable outfit, left me and went to see the officer, who was in a tight spot, stating his claims as to what he could achieve. As you can imagine, the tormented man, despairing of ever being able to enjoy me again, thought out a tongue. In short, the scar that wasn't there was removed with holy water, sprinkled over my face six times, and a few words resembling the Ave Maria, but actually meaning nothing at all. <laughs> and the hundred smackers ended up in my hands. Very welcome they are too. And a Merry Christmas to them all. <laughs> and did the officer know it, understand it, and believe it? He knew it without knowing it, understood it without understanding it, and believed it without believing it. <laughs> so that was that. There's a sting in the tail. There's more. This is the best bit. <laughs> After all these disbursements, for which they say he had to sell his knighthood, the big oath was reconciled with me by means of some mediators and some letters and messages singing his passion. And as he was on his way to throw himself at my feet in sackcloth and ashes, picking up a few words on the way to win back my good graces, he happened to pass the workshop of a painter who painted a picture of the miracle. And fixing his eyes on it, he saw himself, dagger in hand, scarring poor me. But this would be nothing if it weren't for the inscription. I am a Donna Pippa, adoring this a man. Oh, 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 oh,
Frenchman, rushing home at his wit's end, off to buy me a new dress, if I consent to have his name removed from the picture. <laughs> oh, I am proud of you. The moral of the story is this. Thuggishness proved costly. And he ended up giving me money to travel, even to places I hadn't vowed to go. In fact, he gave me so much money, I could have been absolved by the Pope himself. <laughs> I could have been all proud. You know, a soldier who knows only how to ski, steal and scare prison chaplains is a good for nothing who will never be hired. But a soldier who goes into battle and proves his ability is sought after by all the armies and paymasters in the world. So to a whore who knows only how to be worked over and nothing more will never get rid of her threadbare fangs and calico gowns. So mother, as I learned from you, I had to have skill. Or oh, luck. If I was asked straight out, I'd say I'd rather be lucky than skillful. Oh, me too. There's no effort with luck, but skill makes you sweat, as I find out. And you need to be able to live by your wits and, and read the stars, as I think you told me. And as if to prove that if you're lucky, there are no obstacles, just look at that good-for-nothing, lousy bitch, you know the one. She's filthy rich. Just by me. She has no, no grace, no talent, not a single redeeming feature. No figure. She's awkward. Over 30. <laughs> but she must have honey down the way, the way they all run to her. Luck or skill? Ask servants, lads, pimps. Don't let me tell you. Luck makes them gentlemen and monsignors, not skill. Messer Traiano used to carve grinding bowls, now he owns a fine palace. Luck. Luck. Said up he could groom dogs, then he was made Pope. Luck. Luck. <laughs> At course he was an errand boy for a goldsmith, then he was made Julius II. Luck. Luck. <laughs> and so when you find both luck and skill in a whore, then... Sorsum corpa. Because that is even more satisfying than the... Right there. Right there, you say, with the finger that's been scratching around, going the up a bit, left a bit, right a bit, <laughs> finally finds the spot that's been torturing you. Lucky her who has both skill and luck. Luck and skill. Go back, though, to where you left off. Have you ever met any men with eccentric tastes? Have. They're like naughty monkeys that can be pacified with a nut. <laughs> what about those intellectual snobs that gave me so much trouble? <laughs> what cruelty, what penance it is to have to rule over those smart acts. They never speak for fear of unburning the lips they spent time in front of the mirror arranging. Or if they do speak, they open their mouths so carefully. Their lips fall back exactly into place, always taking the, your words the wrong way, eating professorially spitting perfect spheres, looking down their noses. They want to be seen with whores, but would prefer not to get out. They're careful not to give you money in front of servants, but make sure the servants know they're giving it to you. That is the kind of men they are. And they keep a tag of their... Sleeping, waking, eating, fasting, going out, staying in, doing it, not doing it, talking, staying quiet, laughing, not laughing. And it's all done so superbly. It would surpass even a new bride. But that is nothing. It all becomes too much when you're forced to account for your earnings and your intention as to your savings. I played them at their own game and embroidered the money it took, uh, the, the effort it took to earn the money. Have I told you anything about hypocrites? No, dear, but I know them well. They'll only touch themselves down there if they're wearing gloves, and they are devoutly devotional. 
every Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. They came to see me on the sly, and if, after requesting the honour of taking a back road, I'd say, oh, like that, hmm? from behind, <laughs> they'd say, oh, you. Mother, I did as you told me and kept these people's business a secret. Did not spell them, spill the beans about their dirty ways. It was for your own good, those good for nothings. Rope, suck and penetrate every hole and crack, just like any other scoundrel. Once they find a woman who knows how to hush up their sleazy habits, they delight in that, give it their ball without holding back. And then when they're tying up their cod pieces, they'll start babbling on, reciting their prayers, and then set off to scratch the itches of lepers. Oh, may they all be flayed, not the lepers. They'll suffer worse one day, no doubt. And their mean little souls will be trampled underfoot by those other miserable, greedy pigs. I bled them dry, drip by drip. I am proud of you. And you know, I can see that I was right to make you into a courtesan rather than a wife or a nun. <laughs> yes, and I must thank you. Because nuns ruin their vows and rip them into pieces, and wives ruin holy matrimony itself. But Wars stay free. They never wreck a husband or a nunnery. They're indeed like soldiers who are paid to do the dirty work. And while they're doing it, no one bats an eyelid because they are sticking to their trade. And when an innkeeper opens his tavern for the first time, then he does not write up front that there you shall eat, play, fuck, fight, trick. Anyone going in to eat or to fast or to pray would find neither altar nor let. Farmers sell vegetables, apothecaries sell herbs, and whores sell swear words. Lies. Dirty tricks. Scandals. Gossip. Poverty. Dirty tricks. Hate. Dishonesty. You're right to make me a first-class courtesan in front of the world. And with a little penance and a few drops of holy water, every speck of boredom will be washed from our souls. And as you told me, as an I, and as I learned from experience, the vices of a whore are virtues. And more than that, it is a beautiful thing, always being called my lady, even by lords, always dressing like a lady and dining like a lady, and always attending weddings and parties, as you know better than I do. It is important to be able to satisfy one's own desires. And what is more, Rome has always belonged. I will always belong to whores.